Not that you shouldn't study fallacies, you certainly should, but it's important that you do the positive work of establishing what are true relations. What is a true syllogism? Hey, I'm Shane, and this is my guest, Mitchell Holly, back for our episode on logic. Um, Mitch, we, we've started these episodes already with a couple of stories, and I, I feel like I need to start with another story here. So, <laughs> you refuse to tell me what the story would be. <laughs> as our, our listeners have already heard, Mitch and I grew up together. Um, we met in, I think, 2007. We were in high school at the time. Um, and we became fast friends. They're his twin brother and another friend of ours. Um, we were just very close. Mm -hmm. And a great example of not what we were talking about was <laughs> the ultimate just promise of our friendship. For some reason, we decided, the four of us, that anything that any of us had was the others as well. Yeah. We would say, one of us would make a demand on the other and say, hey, I need you to drive me here or I need you to give me $20. Yeah. And the other would say, this is the brotherhood. Yeah. I have to. Yeah. <laughs> so at one point, even you, like, I got in a bad situation and I needed your car for a week. <laughs> and you had to give it to me. Right. It was a, it was a moral obligation, I would say. This uh, is a classic example of illogic. That made no <laughs> sense. <laughs> But that was our that was our policy. Well, uh, you you know you say that it's a classic example of, of of being illogical, but you know in the classical tradition, uh, friends share things in common, and so from another direction, maybe it was the most logical thing <laughs> to define to define my obligation in the <laughs> sense of uh, of of uh, what what it means to be a friend. Yeah, good point. Good point. So our episode today is about logic. It's the second of the trivium. We talked about grammar. We've talked about the liberal arts as language skills, specifically the trivium as language skills. And these all work together. We've said that over and over again. But there is precise definitions. Uh, there are precise definitions that are helpful for understanding these terms. So today our task is logic. What, what is logic? Well, first of all, I think the opener did, did, helped us in terms of definition, right? Because what we were engaged in is, is an activity of thinking. All right. It's the right. skill of thinking. And in this particular example, what we were debating and thinking about what constitutes logical behavior and what constitutes illogical behavior. Right. <laughs> you know, so the ability to make distinctions, the ability to, to think well about, um, about difference or the sameness um, or trueness or falseness hmm. or valid or invalidness. Which right. is probably not the best uh, <laughs> ad adjective, but uh, yeah, I think you get the point, right? Yeah. It's, it's the law. It's the skill of thinking well. Mm. And so, what is the subject of logic? What kind of content do you cover? Right. So, and in, in when you if you're going to take a logic class with us, um, you know, or in the classical tradition, you're going to take you're going to study the uh, the uh, the art of the syllogism, mm. and you're going to study syllogistic logic. You know, that's going to have you know, your premises and then the deduction from the premises. So it's deductive reasoning. Um, and it's in the context of language. This is why traditional logic is very different than modern logic. Mm. And we would say that traditional logic um, or Aristotelian logic um, is, why, or let me put it this way, while Aristotelian logic is central to the skill of logic, to the trivium, Modern log logic is not central. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's for a couple of reasons, right? So in, in traditional logic is language based. Mm. It is it is the the study of of the uh, it's language skill. It's part right, of the trivia. Right. Um, where it, whereas modern logic is um, the manipulation of symbols. You know, so we've all I'm sure many of us have had a modern logic class where like you're in a class and it's, you know, if P prime is in S situation at T time, then that will entail B result. That was, that's painful. <laughs> it's not only is it kind of painful in terms of just a mind, I just, I'm not really getting it. So it's not really intuitive. It's highly, highly conventional, conventionalized, right? It's really developing something, um, you know, that's kind of mathematical even. 
Um, you know, there's other things we could say about modern logic, but it, it does. It's not language based. It's not right. talking about the truthness or falseness of um, linguistic statements. Right. Um, it's it's trying to do something else, and so it doesn't really accomplish the same goals. And as a result, if you're studying modern logic, you're really not studying the trivium because the trivium is a, the language skills. Right. It's it's a perfectly fine discipline in its own right. It's helpful for sure. the things that these conventions, and there are multiple conventions. There's not just one in modern logic, but, and they're, they're super helpful for what they accomplish and students should study it when they go, go to college. But we are interested in building students who know how to learn. And in order to do that, they need grammar and they need to know how to think. And right. that's logic. Right. And, and, you know, it's an interesting point, right? And I, and I guess we would just say that, that um, you know, there is probably is a place for modern logic, but is it is it as central to a classical education, and um, it, in the sense that it's developing those liberal skills, mm. and that's where I would say that you know I think traditional logic is going to do a much better job um, because it is a language skill. Right. So that's a good segue into my next question, which is in our curriculum, how does logic come up? Where are the places that students are studying logic in a classical education curriculum? Even more impressed, more impressed online academy. Yeah, so you know we're we're kind of fitting into that eighth grade year, eighth eighth or ninth grade, but eight, but seventh through ninth grade would be a fine place to insert kind of a traditional logic program. That's right at the time where the students have probably accumulated a, quite a lot of definitions, um, and now they're ready to start making distinctions. Um, and especially in a content rich education, right? You're, you know, a classical education, you're, you're spending a lot of time working on grammar. Mm -hmm. uh, but you also, so you're, you're prepared in terms of you have a grammar foundation, so you're ready to start making distinctions. But by that time, you're also probably already making distinctions on your own. You're already trying to make the argument about what's true and what's false, mm -hmm. but yet you haven't been trained in the, uh, in right. the skill of logic. Right. And so your arguments are maybe a bit emotional at times, you know, maybe they're not as, as clear and concise as they need to be. And so, because, you know, that's the natural age where, you know, students are beginning to kind of on their own practice logic, um, then that's a great time to begin the study of formally begin the study of, uh, of logic. I've heard Martin say that a great preparation for traditional logic, because you're using Martin Cothrin's traditional logic curriculum at yeah. Maury, Maury Press in the eighth grade year is Latin. Could you speak to that? How does, how does Latin prepare students for traditional logic? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, you know, because logic is a language skill, it's mm -hmm. part of the trivium, um, it is very much tied to language. So it's actually helpful. It, it, to, to realize that a lot of these ideas that exist in logic actually first occur in uh, language studies. So mm -hmm. like, for example, in the study of Latin or the study of Greek or the study of, uh, you know, many languages, you're going to learn about, you know, if-then statements, mm -hmm. uh, you know, or a, sub, uh, a subordinate clause in, you know, a purpose clause or whatever, you know, a purpose clause, a temporal clause, you know, some, you know, it, in terms of Latin grammar, you're going to be looking at each of these, trying to define them. Well, in traditional logic, you're looking at a lot of if-then clauses. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, you know, if this is the case, then this. Uh, if this is the case, and then this, then then this is the result, right? So, have you know, grammar sets the, or sorry, not grammar, logic sets the grammatical foundation for um, formal training in logic, um, and that's why you know this just adds to the reasons why why Latin is and really grammar as a skill is so foundational too, but kind of tied together with and integrated with the right, study of logic. Right. Yeah, I think it, it, that's a really good point. And my experience in studying languages, Latin and Greek, is that really the languages start to pop, if you will, mm -hmm. when you start studying relative pronouns, uh, you know, coordinating conjunctions, participles in mm -hmm. Latin and Greek. So in English, as, as you know, we we use these these words and terms in ways that that are very intuitive. We don't have to think about whether we're using the word that to communicate a purpose or a you know a result. Mm. But in Greek or Latin, you're using participles and and relative pronouns in ways that as the interpreter, as the translator, you have to think really hard about is this a a ground clause? Is this a result clause? That's 
90% of the fun of the upper level translation courses is trying to think better about the sentence, about the intent of the sentence, making those really fine detailed distinctions in the ways that the words are used. And so I think in a lot of ways, that's kind of the beginning of logic is starting to even grasp those categories before um, you then get to, to formal logic and start analyzing the extent to which you can make those distinctions in creating and in understanding the validity of arguments. That's right. There's almost a grammar prerequisite <laughs> for the study of, right, of logic, right. right? Like, you know, you have to kind of understand how how clauses relate mm. either templarily mm. or, clausal, or causally or they're providing some sort of ground or explanation. You know, you have to understand that those grammar concepts mm. – because when you when you apply them to the syllogism, they become logical concepts, right. um, and that's why you know, as Bart has said, uh, you know, Latin really is the the best prep for the study of, of logic. Yeah. So in a lot of uh, circles, we still study logical fallacies when we don't study logic, the system itself. And I wonder, right. what do you think about that? Is is it helpful to start with logical fallacies? And what, and what do you th and first tell me what is a logical fallacy? And then let's go from there. Yeah. Well, a logical fallacy are the ways in which logic goes wrong. <laughs> it's when uh, when logic turns dark. Right? <laughs> it's uh, it's when, uh, you know, the syllogism is false, when mm -hmm. the syllogism breaks down, whenever it's an untrue, uh, when, when it's not logically valid. Um, and so, no to your question, um, you shouldn't necessarily start with the study of, of uh, fallacies. Not that you shouldn't study fallacies, you certainly should. But it's important that you do the positive work of establishing what are true relations. What is a true syllogism? Mm. What are the ways that you can reduce syllogisms to their, you know, smallest, so their smallest, you know, common like little parts, so that you can analyze them, right? So you have to kind of do that constructive work before you can do um, the sort of destructive work. And mm. if, when you study fallacies, you, you're 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 just, you're studying how things go wrong, and right. that's important. You need to know when arguments break down, um, when um, when syllogisms are 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 failing, um, but you. You need to first, that seems like a secondary thing, mm. right? You need to first study um, what makes a syllogism true. You need to first be able to reduce syllogisms. You need to be able to find internal premises um, and, and find the ways that they can be, that you can build true statements. And I think what you'll find is actually you'll get more out of your study of logical fallacies uh, when you've done the hard mm. work of trying to build logical statements uh, right. when you've done the hard work of building good and true syllogisms and learn the different ways that you can do that um, and the different ways to you know reduce syllogisms and things like that so yeah. yeah there's it's you know i think one a common mistake is to is to say you know i think you know we're all a lot of us are approaching classical education from oh, later in life right right like you and I had probably a true classical education in our upper years, right? So like basically college and 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 after that, um, and so you know for a lot of people are like you know I, la logic is really important. I think I I hear you, but maybe I just don't have time to do a year or two of logic. Let's just do, you know, let's just hope make sure my student gets uh, like a semester of logical fallacies, and that right. that's going to be sufficient. And the reality is, you know, maybe like it's helpful. It's helpful to get logic, you know, that th that would be fine. But ideally, you know, if we have the time, uh, having a s solid foundation in traditional logic and and can the constructive side uh, of the syllogism would be um, would help a student get the most out of out of logic. Yeah, that's that's well said. And you know, one of the things that we have circled quite a bit in these conversations and in these episodes is the fact that the language skills of the trivium are involved in every subject in our, in, along the way. That is, we we try to really hard to view the liberal arts as the content, as the curriculum of education. And so while there are various aspects of the liberal arts that come out at various stages, it's not a hard break of grammar, logic, rhetoric. So you've talked about the fact that we study actual traditional logic in eighth grade. We study the fallacies after we've been grounded in traditional logic. We prepare for the study of logic through the study of Latin. How does logic show its face in other subjects that we study um, in our curriculum? Yeah. 
Um, I think a great example of this would be uh, in in a class that requires a good amount of rhetoric. Okay. Actually, okay. Um, you know, so a class like a literature class, okay, where you're reading a novel mm. and then you have to make persuasive arguments. Mm. Well, how are you going to make persuasive arguments if you don't know what, you know, if you can't think correctly about what makes something true? If right. you can't think well, right, right? you're going to be really bad at rhetoric if you don't have a grounding in logic right? right and so when you get to you know a, a class like a, a literature class where you're kind of debating ideas talking about themes even if you're not trying to persuade you know your classmates or your teachers to like to a particular reading of a novel um you, you're you're going to be in a kind of a unique situation where you have to put your thoughts about a novel mm -hmm. and clearly and truly to your students and to your teachers you're gonna to have to speak so any class that's going to require you to to speak and reason about uh, about and provide a justification for why you believe what you believe mm -hmm. um is going to be a class that's going to emphasize logic right and the way you know it just it bring comes back to the point that all of these work together and, and that we're never going to get to a place where we use rhetoric if we don't first have logic. And that, that's why the uh, upper school literature guides from Memorial Press are broken into grammar, logic, and rhetoric very mm. explicitly. Yep. Um, is because once we know those facts to know, once we know that vocabulary, once we know the plot as it's written, we have to get inside the head of Elizabeth Bennett. Why is she doing that? What causes her? What is the result of this action that we see? What is the purpose and these kinds of logical distinctions that can then be reduced to syllogistic form if we want to, to analyze them, become the, the meat of the conversation once we yep. kind of weaponize them in rhetoric, which let's not get ahead of ourselves is right. you know, next <laughs> next episode on rhetoric. Right, right. Well, and and, I, and this is where in a lot of ways, I mean, a literature class is bringing all, like as, as our guides are kind of trying to show students literature and the discussion of literature you know, and, and really a discussion of all of the human sciences mm -hmm. is where these three skills kind of become, um, had both have a role to play mm -hmm. and kind of they see their apotheosis, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, when you're in the, th again, the three human sciences would be um, uh, moral, uh, the moral science, or sorry, uh, history, philosophy, and literature, right? So um, in each one of those, those, those subjects, yes, there are science, but you can kind of, you, you you can see how, uh, as our guides show, there's a grammar component, there's a logical component, and then there's a rhetoric component, um, and those those domains of knowledge is where the the trivium those language skills really thrive. Mm. So, what happens when logic is abandoned in our culture? as it seems like it has been. It's been abandoned in the curriculum. There's a lack of precision. Definitionally, we're not able to make the distinctions we once were able to make. What? Why is it so important that we recover logic? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, Alistair McIntyre, who's a, a, a kind of a moral political philosopher uh, who taught at Notre Dame for a while, um, talks about kind of this idea of what happens in a culture mm. when we lose our ability to argue based upon discernments about what's true mm. and how to think well. Yep. And uh, he labels this um, a sort of emotivism mm. where, um, where, and that's how he describes the state of moral arguments today. In other words, an emotivist culture is a culture where we've exchanged um, logical, valid, kind of impersonal, unbiased reasoning for mere statements of preference. Mm. But here's the kicker. In an emotivist society, they don't recognize they've made this switch. Right, right. They don't recognize that they've, that, that you know, when we, we make moral appeals or political appeals, we are largely, you know, in, in the state of modern philosophy today, we're largely doing that from a sort of just statement of preference. We're not really making logical, clear justifications for our views about what's good, what's bad, what policies should be out there, that those conversations tend to be reduced in a motivist society um, to just mere statements of preference. Mm. And so Alistair McIntyre helps us kind of begin to see what would happen in a society where uh, we've lost the ability to think well. When we've, and when we've replaced thinking well 
with just mere statements of preference. Right, right. It makes me think of the fact that most discourse that you that we consume, it's on platforms that are not conducive to pro- elevated discourse. Mm-hmm. It comes from from parties and factions that don't appear to have a solid grasp of grammar, logic, rhetoric. Mm-hmm. And it just feels like people are yelling at each other all of the time. <laughs> this is what happens in a society that has abandoned logic, yeah. right? You, you yeah. have, um, you know, it, it turns into that sort of emotivism mm. turns into just pl- manipulation mm. where my preferences are against your preferences. And now we're just going to, dis- it's just going to descend into the chaos of yelling, uh, yelling at one another. And I, and I, I think there's some truth to the, a sort of, um, to McIntyre's point about this, this will happen politically, mm. politically in a society where we've abandoned the the trivium, where we've abandoned the skills of logic, and we don't teach that, and we don't embrace that as a value anymore. Then you know our political, the science of bringing people to, together and organizing around you know, central goods would dissipate. Now we're just kind of organizing around mere statements of preference. Um, and so there's a great cost yeah. um, for a student and for a culture that would abandon um, the importance of logic. Yeah, that's well said. It's a good reminder of why it is so urgent that we recover the trivium, that we recover mm-hmm. grammar, we recover logic, that we make proper distinctions, and that we make sure that our students are grounded in how to think well before we send them out into the world. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, thank you for that helpful discussion of logic. And next time we'll be talking about rhetoric. <laughs>